colleagues here. So for the professionals in the room, uh, one of the most important Silicon Flatirons traditions, and one I hope you will all take part in today, is engaging with our students, sharing your wisdom and your work, and helping our students network and find their way into shared communities. Uh, so please do that at the reception and breaks. And of course, under the longstanding Phil Weiser rule, uh, the first question in each Q&A will go to a student. With that, I'm happy to turn things over to Colorado Dean Lolita Buckner Ennis for some opening remarks. Dean Ennis. Thank you so very much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, first of all, welcome, welcome, welcome this Sunday morning. It is a pleasure to see you all, especially on a day when perhaps some of us uh, might still be snuggled up in front of a fireplace. Uh, it is really, really my pleasure and honor to be here to welcome you all to Silicon Flatirons Center and to the University of Colorado Law School. As many of you know, Silicon Flatirons was founded in 1999 by Phil Weiser, a former professor, a former dean at the University of Colorado Law School, and now our Colorado Attorney General. For over two decades, Silicon Flatirons has worked to initiate sustain and elevate the conversation about technology law, policy and entrepreneurship, among other topics. Conferences like this have proven critical to these goals by bringing together academics, government officials and industry leaders to discuss emerging issues that are having or will have significant impact on our lives. Before I go any further, as I reflect on the wonderful work that Silicon Flatirons is doing, I wanna take just a few moments to welcome our newest executive uh, director, Professor J. Brad Bernthal. We are so delighted to have Professor Bernthal. As many of you know, he has a specialist, uh, specialization in entrepreneurship, innovation, and other areas that look to the future. And I just wanna give a hand. Thank you so much, Professor Bernthal, for taking on this important, this vital, and this incredibly time-consuming work. We owe you. Thank you so very much. Silicon Flatirons, besides serving the public in a number of ways, has as a central goal to educate our Colorado law students and provide them with opportunities to learn about work on some of the most pressing issues of our times. On the topic of students, I'll take a moment to acknowledge the Colorado Technology Law Journal, a Colorado student-run journal that often publishes pieces that come out of conferences like this. I also want to acknowledge the Silicon Flatirons Student Group, which has worked to increase student engagement in this event, including leading a primer session later this week. Today, we began a conference on the topic of the internet's midlife crisis. Now, when I say midlife crisis, I'm sure that that might be a familiar phrase to many of us, more familiar than we might like to think of that. When we talk about midlife crisis in humans, we often describe it as a time of intense introspection, stress, that often occurs a few decades after entering adulthood. Now, people going through midlife crisis may, on the one hand, be very proud of their accomplishments. It's a great opportunity to pause and look back at the things that one might have done since entering adulthood. But on the other hand, midlife crisis can also be a time where you consider feelings of dissatisfaction with the realization that your stated goals in your early youth might not have been achieved. Midlife crisis is a very apt metaphor for looking at the internet and for the discussion that we're going to have over the course of this conference. The history of the internet can be traced back to the 1960s when the US Department of Defense introduced the concept of a global network of computers to share information. By the 1990s, the World Wide Web, a system of interconnected documents and other resources were created, allowing for easy access and the sharing of information via the internet. Now, some of us in this room can remember those early days of commercially available internet in the 1990s, when early interactions were achieved by 
dial up connecting with an existing landline, meaning that for some of us, no one else in the house could use the phone if you were dialing up to the internet. Remember those days? Some, some of us do. Now at my home, we had a unique situation because my husband is a telecom scientist who works in fiber optics research. And that meant that we were always the very first on our block to adopt anything. We had half dozen phone lines. We were the first people with a 56K modem that we knew. Still, service was at a snail's pace. And I totally remember getting ready to download some software and then going to bed because it was gonna take all night for that to download. Some of us remember those days. There were providers like CompuServe, America Online, who remembers that? Prodigy, Earthlink, the widespread adoption of the World Wide Web and the development of browser software led to a significant increase in people using the internet. And so it's not surprising that since its creation, the internet has had a profound impact on the way that we communicate, access information, and do business. It's enabled globalization. In fact, to the extent that we understand that word, I think implicit for all of us is the idea that we can eliminate geographical barriers because of the internet. It's created new opportunities for people to engage, to collaborate on projects. It's also had an important impact on the economy, fueling growth of the technology sector and changing the way that we work and consume products and services. We are all in many respects, not just consumers of information, but purveyors of information. I am sure that many of us, if not all of us in this room, have thought about what it would have meant if the COVID-19 pandemic had occurred in a pre-internet world. What would that have looked like? Without the internet as a means of keeping commerce, education, and other key functions going, we would have seen very different social and economic outcomes. Now, having said all that, it's also true that the internet has brought new problems such as the spread of misinformation, cybercrime, and privacy issues. So how do we reconcile those challenges along with the benefits? And who's responsible for thinking about it and reconciling problems? Over the course of this conference, we'll take up some of those questions and hear from a number of experts. As we begin, I wanna start off our program by introducing an honored guest today. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Senator Michael Bennett, who has represented Colorado in the United States Senate since 2009. Senator Bennett earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Wesleyan University and earned his JD from Yale Law School, where he was the editor in chief of the Yale Law Journal. Senator Bennett worked for six years in Denver as managing director for the Anschutz Investment Company and later worked as chief of staff to then mayor and now Senator John Hickenlooper. Before serving in the Senate, Senator Bennett worked as superintendent of the Denver Public Schools where he was responsible for a number of advances in the school system. Throughout his career in public service, Senator Bennett has been known for his commitment to promoting economic growth, addressing income inequality and expanding access to quality education. With a long record of advocating for important and meaningful policies, he continues to be a strong voice for change in Washington and a champion of important causes in Washington, nationally, and especially here in Colorado. Throughout his career, Senator Bennett has demonstrated a commitment to excellence and a passion for advancing the needs of Colorado's people. He is a true asset for our state. And so, friends, I give you without further ado, Senator Michael Bennett. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, and thank you, Dean Ennis, for those very, very kind words, and, and to Colorado Law, and especially the students that are here today for hosting all of us. I'm, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to be here. Uh, I don't think, is Phil Weiser here yet today? I don't mean to call him out in his absence. <laughs> Phil, he said, I, let me time this in a way that I miss Bennett's speech. And then it'll be, <laughs> I, I know him quite well. I've known him since before the two have moved to Colorado, but let me just say in his absence, 
and I'll deny it if you if you say it when he gets here, that Colorado is so fortunate to have someone who fills intellect and integrity on our side. And I wish you'd give him a round of applause for his public service. I also want to thank those who have traveled, everybody who's traveled uh, here today. Welcome to Colorado. Welcome to the most beautiful state in America, including uh, Tim Wu, who I think is here, may not be here this morning. Commissioner Wheeler, who's here in the front row. I deeply appreciate your presence here. And is Assistant Secretary Davidson here somewhere? Thank you for making the trip as well. You know, he's managing the biggest investment to deploy high-speed broadband in U.S. history based on the Bridge Act, a bill that was written, we wrote, here in Colorado, and to put an even finer point on it, on the western slope uh, of Colorado. And Dean, where'd the Dean go? Um, you know, there, as, you, as I know you know, there are still communities and neighborhoods all over America, including in our state, where, that have no access to high-speed internet, and where if there is one person on the internet, Nobody else can be on the internet. 30% of the kids in Aurora, Colorado have no access to high-speed internet, not because it doesn't go by, but because their families can't afford it. The Bridge Act, which I wrote with Rob Portman, a Republican from Ohio, and Angus King, an independent from Maine, a truly tripartisan bill, ended up in the, in the infrastructure bill, and I'm glad, very glad it's being administered and, and implemented today. Uh, as Dean Innes said, I, and as I already know, I understand that the theme for this year's conference is the Internet's midlife crisis. And for all the reasons that the Dean said, as a 58-year-old senator, I am highly qualified to address the second half of that idea. Not, not as much the first, but, but instead I, want, I do want to share some broad observations about uh, the Internet's dominance, and in particular, the dominance of the biggest digital platforms over our economy, our society, and our democracy as we meet here on this beautiful day this morning. It's easy to forget how different the world was just 20 years ago when Phil Weiser organized the first of these conferences. At the time, General Motors topped the Fortune 500 list. Apple was 285 on that list. And Amazon didn't even make the cut. Twitter was still an idea somewhere in the recesses of Jack Dorsey's head. Mark Zuckerberg wasn't old enough to vote, even though he'd likely already acquired the undeveloped view of the First Amendment that he holds to this day. <laughs> no one on this planet had ever heard of Gmail or YouTube or TikTok. That was only 20 years ago, but it might, have well as been, it might as well have been 200. Today, Americans spend over two hours a day on social media, more time socializing online than in person. The average TikTok user in our country spends over 80 minutes a day on the app. That is three weeks of every year. I'd say speaking as a parent and a citizen that you could probably learn almost anything but Mandarin if you focused on it three weeks out of the year. But we're using that for TikTok. Facebook, Facebook now hosts 2.7 billion friends, half a billion more souls than Christianity. Twitter has fewer followers, of course, than Facebook, but those followers include every single politician, every journalist, every TV producer in America, withering our political debate to 280 characters and to those effervescent posts. In just two decades, a few companies have transformed much of humanity's daily life, how we amuse ourselves, how we discover, learn, and shop, how we connect with friends and family and our elected representatives, how we pay attention how we glimpse our shared reality or how we don't. This transformation is a staggering testament, of course, to American innovation. And we can all think of a dozen ways these platforms have improved our lives. I, for one, have been entirely relieved of the 
stress the tremendous burden, and for me it was one, of sitting in rush hour traffic, wondering if there is a better route. I am now confident that Waze is guiding me, my own personal North Star. But this dramatic shift from our analog to our digital human existence has never been guided or even informed, I would argue, by the public interest. It's always been dictated by the unforgiving requirements of a few gigantic American enterprises and their commercial self-interest. And what are those interests? To make us better informed citizens, to make us more productive employees, to make us happier people? Of course not. It's been to turn a profit and to protect that profit through economic dominance. And they have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Until their recent battering, the, the market capitalization of the biggest tech companies equal 20% of the entire stock market, a fifth of the entire stock market, a share that one sector has not seen in our nation for 70 years. And through it all, unlike almost any small business, in, whoops, sorry, down the street in Boulder, these digital platforms have remained almost entirely unregulated, moving fast, breaking things, and leaving the rest of us to glue something of our world back together. There's another way these companies are really different from the brick and mortar companies in Boulder. Digital platforms aren't burdened by the fixed costs of, of an analog world. Beyond the blinking lights of their energy intensive server farms, their business is in the cloud, a place where no one works and that requires little physical investment. They have no need to use their profits to invest in America by building infrastructure. Unlike their industrial forebears, today's partners, today's platforms have devised a new digital barrier, uh, sorry, a new digital barrier to entry to protect their profits and their economic dominance. We know that digital barrier as the network effect. As everybody here knows in this room, the network effect means that platforms become exponentially more valuable as more people join and spend more of their waking moments there, more valuable to users because their friends and family are on it, more valuable to the platforms who hoover up our identities for their profit, more valuable for advertisers who pay the platforms for our identities to barrage us with ads and so valuable to the markets that the top five tech companies now have a market cap greater than our entire aerospace, defense, construction, road, and railway industries combined. In the name of building this barrier to entry, this network effect, they have stolen our identities and our privacy and addicted us to their platform. The platform's imperative to grow big and stay big posed a basic question for them. How do you get people onto your platform and keep them there? For platforms like Apple and Amazon, it's to sell products people want, offer subscriptions, and if you're lucky, enmesh them in their closed ecosystem. For social media platforms with free services like Meta, Twitter, and TikTok, the answer is more sinister. Harvest as much data as you uh, on your users as you can. Feed that data to your algorithm to serve up whatever content it takes to keep people hooked so you can keep selling ads. That is their core business model. And although this particular business model has bestowed enormous value on a few companies, it has imposed profound costs on everybody else. Millions of Americans have surrendered to private companies an endless feed of data on their every movement, interest, communication, and contact along with their voices, faces, and fingerprints, all for the convenience of being able to serve, be served up self-gratifying political content on YouTube, less traffic or better movie recommendations. And most Americans have made that trade without even really knowing it. Any suggestion that we have made that trade fairly is ludicrous. It mocks consent. 
The lawyers in this room know contracts of adhesion when they see them. And as a society, we have never asked how much of our identity or our privacy we were willing to trade for convenience and for entertainment. And until today, those questions have been resolved entirely to the benefit of the platform's bottom line. I suppose it would be one thing if there is the great Phil Weiser right there. So another round of applause for us. We're not missing my entire speech. <laughs> I suppose it would be one thing if the only consequence of digital platforms use of our data were to sell better advertising. Even if that would be a fairly pathetic concession of our own economic interests in this world. But as every parent knows and every kid suspects, better advertising is not the only consequence of these business models. Over the years, digital platforms imported features from gaming and from gambling, from brightly colored displays to flashing notifications to likes to perniciously random and incessant dopamine hits, and they unleashed secret algorithms to reverse engineer our most basic human tendencies to seek out tribe approval conformity threat to curate an almost irresistible feed of content americans now spend a third of their waking moments on their phones which we check an average of 344 times a day speaking as a parent who's raised three daughters in this era we certainly have not agreed to run a science experiment on our children with machine learning algorithms, the effects of which almost no employees at the social media companies themselves even understand. And while we're still coming to understand the specific role that social media plays in the epidemic of teen mental health, the early evidence gives us a lot of reason to worry. Here's what we do know. By 2018, half of American adolescents said they were online almost constantly. And as social media took off, teen mental health took a nosedive, especially among teenage girls, like my girl. Teen anxiety, depression, self-harm surge, not just in our country, but in Canada and Britain. One in four teens reported that social media makes them feel worse about their lives. Girls who use social media heavily are two or three times as likely to say they're depressed compared to those who use it less often or who use it not at all. In 2018, suicides for kids 10 to 24 increased 60% compared to 2007. So did adolescents reporting a major depressive episode. Meta's own research found that Instagram made, quote, body images worse for one in three teenage girls and the teens know social media is bad for their mental health but feel unable to stop using it and as america's kids spend more time online they're getting less sleep exercise and in-person interaction they're less happy they're the most connected generation in human history and they're also the loneliest the parents i've met all over colorado have deep concerns about what social media has done to their kids. And I, I'll say here, and I don't, I'm, don't put all of this epidemic at social media's feet, but I was with some people this week and, and I said to them, you know, when I hear that a child or a young person, the age of my kids has died in Colorado, I, found, I find myself no longer asking what, what was the accident they had? You know, what did they have leukemia or cancer. I find myself asking, was it fentanyl? Was it suicide? Was it guns? That's, that's the country that, that we're threatening to, to pass on to the next generation of America. That's not the country that I grew up in. All of my young staff and my two eldest daughters universally say how lucky they were to avoid middle school in the age of social media. Their young siblings, like our youngest daughter, have not been so lucky. 
I've heard many expressions of concern over the years about this, but I have to say the most poignant expression of this concern were the moms that I met in the Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta, where my wife, Susan, grew up, one of the poorest places in America. One after the other told me their kids don't read anymore because no book can compete with their phone. Even as Silicon Valley executives who design these phones sometimes send their kids to digital detox camps each summer. These parents work two or three jobs, can't afford childcare, and have to compete for their child's attention against this algorithmic poison. They've never stood a chance. My constituents are most worried about their kids and about their families, but they're also they also worry a lot about our democracy in this era of social media dominance. And they've got a lot of reason to be concerned. When I first joined the Senate in 2009, it was the summer of the so-called Twitter revolutions in Egypt and Libya and Tunisia. We then heralded as the Arab Spring. At the time, people in Washington and all around the world hailed social media as a powerful tool for democracy. It didn't take long for tyrants to turn it against democracy. The dictators who once feared social media soon harnessed it for their purposes to track opponents, to dock cities and flood the zone with propaganda. Nobody understood this better than Vladimir Putin himself. He saw the vast and unregulated power of America's social media over our democracy and he exploited it ruthlessly ahead of the 2016 election. Putin flooded our social media with dis disinformation. According to the Mueller report, the Russians, quote, conducted social media operations with the goal of sowing discord in the US political system. They sought to fracture America across every conceivable line, race, religion, class, sexuality, and politics, playing both sides with over 10 million tweets and nearly 4,000 fake accounts, some of which actually inspired Americans to show up to gather, to protest, you know, their own government. And we let it happen in large part because we struggled to distinguish. In fact, we couldn't for a year and a half distinguish between the Russian propaganda and our degraded online political conversation. You should ask yourselves what that says about the nature of our political conversation. I was running for re-election that year here in the state of Colorado. And when I later joined the Senate Intelligence Committee, I began to realize that this problem extended far beyond our borders. That's why three years ago, I wrote to Mark Zuckerberg, warning him that Facebook had become authoritarians, what I called platform of choice to suppress their opposition. I also warned him that Facebook's insatiable drive for growth had given the company power over countries that they barely understood and the consequences have been horrific horrific in myanmar the united nations named facebook a significant factor in stoking communal violence against the rohingya after it repeatedly ignored calls to remove hate speech and hire more staff who actually knew the country around the world we've seen fake stories on these platforms spark violence in india sri lanka and kenya just to name a few and on January 6, 2021, here in the United States of America. In the weeks before January 6, President Trump, our first president who ran his campaign and his administration almost exclusively through the social media platform of Twitter, incited a, rob, a mob to invade our capital. It would never have happened without social media. Social media is where the big lie caught fire, where platforms gave the big lie the ring of truth through sheer repetition, where algorithms mix cocktails out of pedophilia rings and Jewish cabals and QAnon rumors intoxicating dentists and, and soccer moms with a seditious rage. I remember sitting in a windowless basement on the Capitol on the 6th. We watched CNN as our fellow citizens invaded the US Capitol with their racist banners, flags, and their anti-Semitic t-shirts to save an election that 
had never been stolen, that had not been stolen. And while the Senate was in that embarrassing position, unable to certify an election for the first time in American history, Moscow and Beijing transformed those images into propaganda as I knew they would in their campaign to discredit democracy in the eyes of the world. Beijing claimed the riots were a sign of internal collapse. Moscow observed that American democracy was limping on both feet. In these moments, we cannot bury our heads in our digital feeds. We are called upon to defend democracy and burnish our example at home. And we can help by reining in the vast power of digital platforms and reasserting the interests of the American people and our public interest. The Americans who came before us would never have known about algorithms and network effects, but they would have recognized well the challenge that we face and their example should guide our way. The founders themselves, as everybody in this law school knows, devised an elegant form of checks and balances to guard against tyranny. After Upton Sinclair exposed ghastly conditions in meatpacking facilities in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt joined Congress to create the Food and Drug Administration. As broadcasting became more central to American life in 1934, FDR and the Congress enacted the Federal Communications Commission. And after the 2009 financial crisis, in our own time, President Obama and Congress established the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. In each case, Congress knew it lacked the expertise to oversee complex new sectors of the economy, so it created independent bodies to empower the American people. Today, we have no dedicated entity to protect the public interest, and we have been powerless as a result. And that's why last year I proposed to create a federal digital platform it's essentially an FCC for digital platforms, an independent body with five Senate-confirmed commissioners empowered to protect consumers, promote competition, and defend the public interest. The commission would hold hearings, conduct research, pursue investigation, establish common sense rules for the sector, and enforce violations with tough penalties that could make a difference. Some may say we don't need it. We already have the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. And these agencies are staffed by hardworking public servants. I used to work at the Department of Justice, and I know that. But they don't have the expertise. They don't have the tools or the time to regulate this new sector. And as we fight to empower the American people, there are other important steps that we can take now from limiting targeted ads to kids, reforming Section 230, pursuing antitrust remedies, establishing a digital bill of rights for parents and kids, and compelling more transparency from platforms to allow policy and research to be done. And in the case of TikTok, Apple and Google should remove it from their app stores today and stop Beijing from hoovering up more data on 100 million Americans. Whatever we do, we cannot accept another 20 years of digital platforms transforming American life with no accountability to the American people. We still haven't come to grips with the full cost of our inaction so far, the cost to our privacy and to our identity, to our time and to our attention, the trust in our democracy and the faith in our fellow citizens, the self-confidence of millions of American teens and the lives of far too many. None of the problems that I've described today are unique to America, but America bears a unique responsibility to solve them. After all, it was American companies that blazed the trail into the digital age and invited all of humanity to follow. We now live in a, in a world they created with its wonders and conveniences, but also its risk dangers, and difficult questions. The same platforms that amplify a protester's cry for freedom in Iran 
also equipped tyrants around the world to suppress democratic movements. The same technologies that liberated anyone to say anything also unleashed a perpetual cacophony, leaving us all screaming louder to be heard. The dazzling features that brought the world online have also trapped us there, more connected but more alone, more aware but less informed, enthralled to our screens, growing more anxious and angry and addicted every day. Overcoming all of this will not be easy, but we can't simply hide under the covers, scroll through TikTok and hope these problems solve themselves. That is our job. The health and future of our children lie in the decisions that we make or that we fail to make. Our objective, my objective, is not to hold the world back. In Colorado, as Phil knows, as his faculty knows, as students know, we have always embraced innovation. But we also understand that not all change is progress and that it's our job to harness those changes toward a better world. We are the first generation to steer our democracy in the digital age. And it is an open question whether democracy can survive in the world digital platforms created. I may be wrong, but the evidence so far does not fill me with confidence. It fills me with urgency urgency to reassert the public interest, to reclaim our public square and our exercise in self-government, to level the playing field for America's teens, for our parents, for our teachers, for our small businesses, who for 20 years have battled alone against some of the most powerful companies in human history. Success won't be easy, but this is a fight worth having. It is a fight worth winning. And if we succeed, we may, not, we, we may not just help to save this democracy. We may help to save it all over the world. Thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Senator Bennett, I think uh, if we've got a few minutes sure. for uh, questions, now that Phil Weiser is here, we'll have to enforce the Phil Weiser rule, uh, which means that the first question uh, goes to a student. So a question from a student. I think I see Jackson back there. Jackson. And if you could wait for the mic to get to you and introduce yourself. Hello, I am, my name is Jackson. I'm the tool here at Colorado Law. I'm in Blake's Tech Law and Policy Clinic. Uh, Senator Bennett, thank you so much for taking the time to come talk to us today. In the wake of West Virginia versus EPA and the Supreme Court's decision there, do you think establishing a new commission poses unique challenges, particularly in this atmosphere? You mean for... Yeah, correct. I think it's... <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I do. But I look, I don't think that, you know, I mean... I live in a world where we're all going to have to, you know, understand that we live in Neil Gorsuch's view of the Chevron doctrine and all that stuff. That that does not mean that we should roll over and give up. I don't think. You know, it, one other thing I'll say about this is that it is unusual for a, a Western politician, even a Western Democrat, to call for a uh, a new federal agency. We don't typically like those, and I. And there are lots of federal agencies I don't like. But uh, the reason I reached the conclusion is that there is nobody else to do this work in Washington today. And I know Congress can't do it. You know, even if we pass one bill on antitrust or something like that, that'll mean that we never get to teen mental health. That'll mean we'll never get to the Russians using these digital platforms to divide us from one another. And that's why I think we really do need an administrative agency to do it. All right, next question from the audience. I see a hand back there. Joanna Blumenthal, I'm a CU Law alum and current master's student at Regis University in software engineering. Um, thank you for coming again, Senator Bennett. Um, you said there's no other way but another administrative agency. 
What is the role of the computing professional organizations here to rein in their own, just like we have for law and medicine and so many other professions? Well, I do think there is a role. I do think there is a role for the society at large here. I mentioned at the very end the notion of having a bill of rights for parents and for kids. I don't imagine that being something that the federal government creates. I imagine that, you know, a world where maybe you, 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 you have some version of something that didn't exist when I was a kid, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that takes um, the view that, you know, that we, they have not made a trade to subject their kids to these uh, platforms in the way that they have, and that kids are entitled to a set of rights when it comes to their privacy, when it comes to their content, their identity, their freedom. And, um, and, uh, and that that could that's I think could be society's role even more broadly understood than a professional organization. I think we we have we have a role to play. You know, Mark Zuckerberg's answer to all of this seems to be always, you know, more speech is better. More speech is better, and he has no conception of of trying to regulate this himself or to deal with these issues himself. So I, I don't have a lot of hope that the, that the big digital platforms themselves are going to do it, but you know I, that's. But I continue to have some. That's why I sent them a letter the other day asking them to take TikTok off the app store at Apple and Google. So this is a, it's an important point that you make. This is not an issue for government alone. I think we've got time for two or three more questions. I'm going to go to another student, Hella, right there. That's good. That's now the Bennett rule, which is we get student after student after student here. Uh, hi, thank you so much, uh, Senator Bennett. My question is, uh, with the FDA, with the FCC, with the CFPA, uh, there was an acknowledgement from both sides of the aisle in terms of the I guess like there is a crisis that we need to solve kind of. Whereas with Digital Platforms Commission, at least one side of the political aisle doesn't seem to necessarily admit that. How, how do you see us kind of moving forward? I think that, um, first of all, nothing will get done here. Not, uh, I, I, let me make a prediction. We will not pass this in a partisan way. This is gonna need bipartisan support to pass it. And Tom Wheeler and I have an old friend we were talking about this morning named Dick Celeste, who's a, who is the governor of Ohio, who over the years has said to me the importance to, in order to make change in America. You know, the, the effort that we must be engaged in is an effort to build a constituency for change. You know, and that's what we have to organize. That's what we have to build. The change isn't going to come from Washington itself. It never does. It always comes from people that are organizing themselves. I would think that law students all across America would have a strong interest in what you know I was talking about today. Some people may totally disagree with my position. And that's totally fine in, in my world. But I'll bet you there are people that see the dangers that we're talking about here and could help begin to organize and mobilize people around these issues, just with voices, by the way, more credible than my own. I refer again to the midlife crisis issue that we were talking about earlier. But, but I think that, that that's very, very important. And the final point I'd make to you is don't give up just because today there's you know, a partisan divide here. We can build a bipartisan consensus, I think, on this as we can with so many things that, the, that this democracy is facing. Hi, Senator Bennett. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you, Silicon Flatirons, for organizing this. Um, I'm Catherine Kelly. I'm a 2L at Colorado Law. Um, my question is about your recent remarks that you mentioned or alluded here to, alluded to here today um, about Google and Apple taking TikTok off the App Store. I was wondering if you think that sets a dangerous precedent in government officials calling for apps to be removed by private companies. Um, I agree with doing that, but I'd want to know how you envision cabining it so it so it doesn't. Well, I'll give you one down. way of cabining it. I'm not saying this is the only way of cabining it, but I'll give you one. One way to cabin it is apps that are owned by companies, ByteDance in this case, that's based in Beijing, that's subject to Chinese law that says when we ask you to cough up data on the American people, 
you have to cough up data on the American people. That's one place we can capitalize. I'm not sure that's the only place. I think, you know, in other places, it may be less about banning things than about trying to modulate them. You know, I, I have in mind the, the um, you know, the really pernicious effects that I've seen among um, young kids in Colorado about their sense of self-worth, their sense of, you know, um, the, uh, their, the sense of their own bodies, that kind of stuff, you know, surely there are ways we can regulate that just as we do in the context of broadcast television. And that's a place where you might not ban something, but you might have something to say about what the content looks like, whether the algorithm actually is something that we want oppressing our children or whether we want some other means of interaction between these digital platforms and our children. All right, we've had the Bennett rule now, the newly coined Bennett rule. We've had the Wiser rule. Now we're going to have the corollary to the Phil Wiser rule, which is that the last question goes to Phil Wiser. Oh. I'd like to offer a friendly amendment to that rule. No. It's great to be here. And you made a point about crisis triggering the sort of regulatory response you're calling for. And you mentioned 2009, you could add to that Enron. What type of crisis will unite people's attention to spur the type of change that you have in mind? I think we're in it right now. We may not know it, but I, I believe we're in it right now. I think that we are, you know, I, when the positive or Pollyannish, optimistic Michael Bennett chooses to believe that we have realized that we've played out the string on Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economics. That we've played out the string um, on that supply-side economics and on a society that has created the worst income inequality that we've had since the 1920s, the least economic mobility that we've had since the 1920s. And I think we see, we perceive that this is a threat to our democracy, and it is, because when people lose a sense that their families or their, their, their kids, if they work hard, can find a place in the economy, can find a place in the democracy. That's when inevitably somebody shows up in human history and says, I alone can fix it. You don't need a democracy. You don't need the rule of law. The stuff these people at CEOs are studying is worthless. You know, you should expect your public sector and your private sector to be hopelessly corrupt, hopelessly bankrupt. And, and and you're a sucker if you, you know, believe in that. That's what we have to stand up for in this crisis. And, you know, Phil and I are both now elected officials. We hear people say all the time, this is the important election of your lifetimes. You know, having seen Donald Trump elected president, having been there on January 6th, you know, when our fellow citizens attacked the Capitol of the United States, so unimaginable when I was the age of the law students here or a student or a kid. Um, to me, that's a sign that every election between now and when we expire is the most important election of our lifetime, and we have to treat it that way, and that we can't accept this notion that, you know, that our democracy is, is a failure. That's what China believes. That's, or put it another way, that's what Beijing believes. After what they saw on January 6th, they believe it. That's what Russia believes. They believe it. And what I choose to, 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 to think about in the wake of all is the mistakes that Vladimir Putin made on the way to invading Ukraine as a consequence of being a totalitarian, running a totalitarian society. It turns out that way of organizing humans is a terrible way of preparing for war. Terrible, because there isn't anybody to tell you that your army actually is lousy or that the money that you spent on it was stolen by corrupt actors or that the Ukrainian people are going to fight you to the death, or something I think he didn't see, and maybe we didn't even perceive, that free people living in these countries all over the world would be so inspired by the bravery of the Ukrainian people that they would rise up in their countries and demand of their elected officials, do more, do more, do more. So I think before our eyes, in, this, in the wake of the crisis that we've had, we're seeing democracy reassert itself. And I think our job is to build on that, to not accept things uh, as they are. The students that are here may be the first generation of, 
uh, Americans really or the ones just below them maybe and the first generation Americans to grow up without any consciousness of what the analog world was before this digital world came and I think we owe ourselves before we leave you know the stage we owe ourselves and we owe the next generation you know the fulfilling a responsibility that says we're going to straighten this stuff out and and I think we can do that. So thanks for having me. Big round of applause for Thanks, everybody.